Hello, everyone, and welcome to our next EDW session called Rebuilding Enterprise Information Management from the da Metadata Group Up, Ground Up, which will be presented by Peggy Zai, the Vice President of Data Solutions at Big ID. Just to note, due to a conflict, this session has been pre-recorded. All audience members are muted during these sessions. Though the speaker is unable to attend, please do feel free to submit questions in the Q&A window on the right of the screen to be reviewed at a later time. Please also note that there is a link form at the bottom of the page titled EDW Conference Session Survey. This is where you can submit session feedback and we encourage you to do so. So let's begin our presentation now. Thank you and welcome. Good morning. My name is Peggy Sai from Big ID. Today, I will be talking about rebuilding enterprise information programs from the metadata ground up. Like many of you in the audience today, I also spent many years in the financial services industry working in enterprise data governance programs. My role predominantly was around building out the strategy and helping to operationalize programs so that it fit the regulatory requirements needed for BCPS 239, Solvency 2, CCAR, and GDPR. I'm really excited to be here today because I really be talking about some of the data management practices that I've seen personally and how there are new AI machine learning technologies that can really help with rebuilding and really reimagining the way that enterprise information management programs can work today. Recently at Big ID, we had a data governance summit where Juan Riojas, Chief Data Officer at Rackspace, gave this quote of data rich, insight poor. And I think we've seen that with a lot of organizations that collect, create, and consume a lot of data. But the challenges they face is the fact that they're not able to get actionable insights on the data. So while they want to treat data as a sacred and strategic asset, they're not able to do so. Now the data challenges that we certainly all see is especially apt when you look at an iceberg. Above this waterline of an iceberg are a lot of the strategic efforts that many data executives and corporate executives are looking at today, such as supporting analytics, building out data science teams, and a lot of the AI machine learning projects are going on today. But below the waterline, in the iceberg is where most of the foundational data capabilities are still being built out. What I'm talking about here is the efforts around building out a data foundation, inventorying, cataloging, data mapping, master data management. These are all very difficult and time consuming activities that require not only your data teams, but also your business stakeholders and your technology teams to work on together. Now, new challenges that have certainly come about for data organizations in the last couple of years really re revolve around growing data environments. Not only are there structured data databases that data teams need to govern, there's also data that's in the cloud, in the lake, streaming data, IoT data. There's just a large amount of data that was never really considered before in traditional data management programs. And if it was, it just was out of scope. And data centers that are being created in new locations, data, new data formats, especially when it comes to unstructured data, data that's in a file, in the PDF, email, um, if many organizations are using um, Google, um, AWS, these are new types of environments of data where it's being sourced. Now, growing regulations play a big part of this because new data in all these types of formats and locations must be considered and in scope. And I think the role of a chief data officer now has to consider data when it comes to um, security and um, the chief security officer and chief privacy officer who have very similar demands and requirements when it comes to data and its consistency and accuracy and use across the organizations. So they may also have requirements when it comes to data usage, data access, controls. 
So when it comes to the different business stakeholders in your organization that has a, a stake in data, how, where do you start? Where do organizations start today in terms of documenting where data is, what it is exactly, when, and ultimately who owns the data in the organization? Now, many of the priorities that come in place when it comes to data management is first and foremost, quality. I think that's one of the first questions that many uh, business stakeholders ask is, what's the quality of my data? And there are different um, perspectives when it comes to data quality, um, depending on the creator of the data, there's specific data quality standards and rules in place but also thinking about it from the data consumers who also need to have a certain expectations when it comes to data quality. Other priorities when it comes to data management programs is the concept around enablement. And this is really important because we're talking about enabling business stakeholders, data users across your organizations to have access, to proper access, and being able to have the right usage of the data. Again, when it comes to many of the new privacy regulations, especially with GDPR, which really set the standard for many organizations to really think strategically about the data that's already being used in their data governance and management programs, but now applying it with privacy mindset in mind. Data lifecycle management, data access, these are all important parts, components of a security management program to make sure that the data that's not only used from a governance perspective is also adhering to compliance and risk standards by your chief compliance officer, chief risk officer. So there are multiple players that are now involved in helping to influence and shape a data management program today. Now the key part of it, especially when it comes down to the chief data officer and his or her data management program, is really looking at the fundamentals. And this is what I spent uh, many years working on, is building out these fundamental capabilities that can then be leveraged across the organization and then be used in multiple purposes, especially for ultimately for analytics or data science, but also now increasingly for data privacy and compliance adherence. So one major, major component of a data foundation program is having a data catalog or an inventory of your data assets. So what does that look like fundamentally? Now, one of the key things and challenges that many organizations face is populating this catalog. Uh, predominantly, it used to be a, a very manual effort in terms of having to collect this information from your data stewards and from your business owners. And that was obviously limited by um, the time and the resources uh, could actually collect into a, a shared tool or spreadsheet. And what about the other information that was needed to understand the data in your catalog, especially in terms of describing the data, putting a definition around it, standardizing and reconciling that business term inside your catalog. These are additional aspects of the data that needed to be populated. And also another big component is looking at now unstructured data that now needed to be part of your um, foundation. So the question that I like to ask many people today is, how do you keep your data catalog up to date? And how do you actually take action on this data after it's been collected and put into your catalog? The challenge again that many organizations face is that this manual effort, and even if it is automated somewhat, the coverage of this catalog is limited to the technology itself. So you wanna make sure that you are selecting a technology solution that encompasses and is representative of your entire data landscape. You don't wanna just be governing your structured data, certainly not. And this is where automation 
is really essential for success. And this is, again, one of the key things that I would have liked to see as a data steward in my former roles in other organizations. The reason why automation is going to be a key differentiator for organizations that embark on this journey is the fact that, again, data, the, data, the scale of data is growing at a very rapid pace. We're talking about data centers, um, petabytes of data spread across global regions, and the fact that it's in, literally impossible for any one person to really have knowledge and understanding and business contacts and usage of all their data. Data is constantly being changed and updated and needs to be reflected in an automated manner as well. As well. So the concept of a data steward uh, role that I used to play is that it's really difficult to keep up with the pace and with the accuracy of the information that needs to be shared across your entire organization. So this is where we look at automation for in terms of being able to scale at fast speeds and really be reflective accurately of the data landscape that's in your organization. And the usage of AI machine learning is really crucial here because it helps to identify patterns, um, identifies outliers in your data. And these are really important insights that can really help a human that's a data steward that's really looking at the data, but is can be really be enabled by a lot of these automated data insights that's available today. And then as a result, be able to take faster and quicker action on the data governance program. So some of the governance capabilities that can be automated with metadata are these on the screen today. Um, talking about data discovery. First and foremost, that's one of the challenges that all organizations face is not just finding the data. Um, they need to actually know exactly where it is and be able to then connect and link it to their known data sources. So being able to get to that information easily using automation is really critical here because you do not want to rely on uh, you know, crowdsourced um, teams to be able to collect and curate that information together. Other capabilities involve data quality and being able to um, leverage automation to identify profile um, outliers in your data and also be able to give really quick insights into the, the completeness and the timeliness of that data. That's not something that you want to um, spend time writing standard operational data quality rules for. Ideally, you want governance capabilities that will um, give you immediate insight onto the quality of your data and your data sets. When it comes to data lifecycle management, these are capabilities around uh, retention policies, how long data should be kept in your organization. Again, this is a huge use case, especially when we talk to many groups in the records management office, and they are spending time finding the data, understanding what data is, and then applying it to their data policies we think there are better ways to automate this process, especially if there's already a foundation that's built on metadata and data that identifies all the data across your organization, and then simply applying the policy that's needed to adhere to those documents. A lot of the efforts that go around governance programs is mainly around stewardship. A lot of the issues around stewardship is the fact that not only is there large scales of data, there needs to be um, immediate action that needs to identify duplications, uh, similarities of data, business terms across the domains. And these are things that can be supported by AI and machine learning. And certainly around um, reducing risk, understanding where there's open access to your files, being able to bring those insights directly to your compliance and risk teams 
are, are hugely are huge critical activities. Now, when we take a metadata bottoms up approach, this really enables us to automate and build repeatable and scalable processes that can support your information management programs. So as I said earlier, capabilities around discovery and multiple ways to discover and link your data together to give, the, to give users insights allows um, data teams um, to, to really be able to scale and build out their programs really quickly. If you combine that, especially with um, deep machine learning insights where not only are we identifying patterns, we're, there are machine learning technologies that can predict a lot of where sensitive and confidential data may be in your, in your organizations. So being able to connect and link all that data together allows a data team to take action on their data much faster. And of course, this data must be, these type of solutions must work um, on scale and um, leveraging automation so that stewards are not burdened by the heavy lifting, work, heavy lifting work of collecting that information. They can simply work, focus on validating and confirming a lot of the insights that come from these machine learning technologies. And most importantly, this data that the scope of data that we're looking at in any organization um, must span across all your data centers, all your cloud and lake environments. The machine learning and data discovery, there are many techniques that can be done today, especially when it comes to leveraging natural language processing classifications, being able to automatically enrich your data sets um, and data attributes with tags and labels. Um, additional techniques that I haven't seen lately in, or in um, the field today, but are available in Big ID is when it comes to correlating the data, that means tying together all related attributes to either a single entity or to a person. And this has been extremely critical, especially when it comes to um, GDPR, privacy regulations and um, fulfilling a data subject access request report. So a lot of the classification comes from identifying this data and um, using machine learning, um, regular expressions, but also other um, techniques around um, named entity recognitions that find data on a document and file level. So we're able to really group together or cluster very similar groups um, simil similarities in the data together. Um, again, this helps data teams identify uh, uh, similar data that's needed to minimize data. Um, again, um, this is for privacy regulations, data minimization, but also from a governance and technology perspective, really be able to know um, where there are duplications and you can identify the, either the single source of truth or really the um, golden copy of data. Now the next two slides that I'm gonna be covering here is just a little bit more about the technology and the platform that Big ID um, talks about is again, intelligence, data intelligence that can be supported from this foundation of data discovery. And being able to um, have uh, lots of sources that we can connect to and being able to virtually provide this in a catalog. So as we automatic, automatically scan your, your data sources today, we're able to visually uh, represent all this information in one single catalog. So this catalog contains you know, operational business, business metadata that really helps um, your data teams and users understand the context of this data. The second piece here is about classifying your data. Classifying your data means being able to understand based on the data values. So more than just looking at metadata, looking at data in conjunction with that allows you to understand exactly um, what is differentiating between a 16-digit number that's a credit card number or 
if it's just a random string of numbers. So by applying techniques like regular expressions and natural language processing and machine learning, deep learning techniques, really being able to um, classify and be able to understand the, the data itself. So that's really the, the first and most fundamental step of being able to build out um, your, your data foundation. The third piece here is around cluster analysis. And as I mentioned earlier, especially when it comes to unstructured data, when you think about all the files that are being created in your you know, SharePoint, your, your local drives, your, your shared drives, all this information, um, whether, it, whether it comes to you know, like PowerPoint or Excel files or you know, PDF files, how many are literally duplicates or variations of each other? And how many would you actually keep if you were to embark on a cloud journey, for example, or you're migrating your data over to a data lake? You really want to think about minimizing the data that um, you'll be moving over. And then you wanna think about um, what copies of data you actually wanna eliminate from your organization whether you're abiding by your data policies of retention or whether or not you just want to have a cleanup exercise, right? So how do teens do this exercise today? Um, it's really literally opening up each file individually and then making that determination. But, but by leveraging a technique called cluster analysis, allows you to see groupings based on the size of similar of the similar files, but also be able to show you keywords or attributes that help describe the grouping so that you understand the context of this information. Again, leveraging this machine learning to give you the insights on whether or not you wanna take action and what priority that action is against your other activities that you have going on. The last one here is correlation. Correlation is was uh, pre uh, predominantly created when, especially when it came to privacy use cases, um, being able to tie together uh, all related attributes um, to a single person. Um, so, you know, being able to find things like um, for a person, for privacy perspective uh, purposes, being able to find uh, related healthcare records or um, cookie and IP settings. Those are all related information that you may or may not know that you're collecting on an individual. Um, but um, when it comes to fulfilling a data subject access request, it's um, information that's, that's, that's needed to be collected. Um, so taking that example of just a, of a person, you can certainly do correlation when it comes to a, an account, um, any type of entity. Um, you know, we've seen it done on other types of information that helps to identify data that you know you may not know that's related to, to that starter set. So, building upon this data discovery foundation, there are very specific applications that can certainly be done to help um, emphasize and take action on, um, on these insights that certainly derived from, from the foundation. So when it comes to data privacy, um, there's apps that we have around um, uh, data subject access request fulfillment, data processing and sharing, and having a privacy portal in place to manage um, a lot of the privacy requests that comes in. Um, data protection apps are our security focused applications when it comes to uh, data remediation, uh, labeling of data, uh, understanding breaches of data. And lastly, data perspective refers to our data governance applications. And these are very specific applications that can be taken to monitor your data quality, um, stewardship, um, certainly with um, understanding the, the, the lineage and um, where exactly uh, all your data is today. So the next portion of uh, my presentation today is really talking about some of these um, customer use cases that uh, we've seen um, um, and uh, obviously not 
speaking specifically for any specific organization, but um, really talking in general, a lot of the types of um, uh, organizations that we, we speak to and that are customers of ours and some of the challenges um, they face. And when it comes to um, financial services, um, predominantly these are global organizations that have, you know, uh, either, um, enterprise wide, um, you know, data programs. But when it comes to their data, you know, they're, you know, bogged down by legacy systems. So they are really have challenges on um, multiple systems that may uh, have their customer data. And how do they work on um, connecting and breaking down those data silos um, and really helping to build out a know your customer management pro risk compliance program and also customer 360. And also as, as companies grow throughout the years and they um, may purchase or take over um, other companies, th throughout those mergers and acquisitions, they may be building upon um, legacy uh, data assets that they now need to include and, and govern as part of their organization. And also new banking and insurance regulations have always played a part in how um, data programs are, are run in financial services industries. And certainly they need to um, be quite conservative, but also be very proactive in um, making sure that um, they have all the controls in place for all the data that's that's in movement. So one of the challenges that uh, we've seen is the fact that with all these mergers and acquisitions, there is no one single group or tech or when it, whether it comes to technology in a business that has a understanding of all their data. Um, and you also consider the fact that you know considering the turnover of employees. Um, that type of documentation and, and knowledge about data and its usage, you know, can easily be um, erased um, if once a person leaves an organization. So this concept here, again, with the data catalog, is being able to um, bring together all the, you know, disparate data sources that are either across your lines of business or that may be part of your, your legacy versus the current data sources, systems, um, you know, really being able to help identify in one singular virtual view all the data that you, know, you may have in your unstructured formats, whether it's your pipeline, cloud, NoSQL data. This is information that um, you wanna make sure that has the proper governance and controls in place. And my Building this data catalog, you're really enabling uh, your data consumers to um, find the right data, um, understand the right data that they need to be using. Um, so not just your business users, we're talking about um, a lot of the business stakeholders and, and privacy and security, and really being able to um, centralize the, the tagging and the enrichment of the data in one single place so that if um, someone on the privacy team is looking at a, a column, they can understand the purpose of use, they can see whether or not it applies to a specific regulation, but also a data governance team member can also look at this same view and understand whether or not um, this, uh, there's a, a definition applied, there's the right data owners assigned to review and govern, um, the data. So really being able to share this foundational knowledge with multiple groups is, is really, again, sort of a, a revolutionary concept that we want to expand this type of enterprise data um, to, be, to be beyond the traditional business and data teams. This part is about machine learning classif classification for any data. And this is really the, the second part after building out a virtual catalog is really being able to put the, um, the labeling, the tagging for your, for your data and extending that to your metadata and possibly um, perhaps even all your documents as well. 
So what's really uh, important here is that you wanna make sure you're using the right technology that reduces false positives and accurately identifies your data on multiple ways. So being able to leverage um, natural language processing and name entity recognition to be able to label your data. And then that would then be applied downstream to your, for example, maybe your data science team for feature creations or for your um, data visualization team for building out your dashboards, um, et cetera. So classification allows downstream data consumers in your organization to know whether or not it's the right context, it's the right data that they should be consuming. And being able to um, leverage a, um, a, a model that allows you to give feedback um, into the results is, is really quite powerful as well because organizations maybe um, have very specific and nuanced information and you want as a con consumer of a user of any technology make sure that you have um, the leverage and ability to then uh, give insights and feedback to train the model and improve the accuracy of that model Retail space has certainly been uh, one of the key drivers, especially in um, leveraging data. Um, you know, when it comes to um, customer segmentations, they really want to be able to improve the experience of the customers through pers personalized products and um, offerings and emails and marketing message. So the retail industry has, you know, certainly been, um, you know, one of the beneficiaries of good data management, good customer 360, and also balancing that with a lot of the privacy regulations where they are collecting a lot of personal information when it comes to a customer. You know, when you, um, uh, you know, go shopping, you may, you know, sign up for their, you know, their credit card or sign up for the rewards on their website. All this information and even browsing on retail companies' websites, you know, you're uh, possibly um, being tracked when it comes to um, the the web pages you go to, the products you link. All this information is being collected in by retail companies, and you want to make. And as a as a retailer, you want to make sure that um, you can. Um, find all this data that's um, being collected and if needed through uh, privacy regulations, be able to uh, delete all that information. Um, data quality has certainly been a, a huge part of uh, a retailer's data organization priorities, especially if they need to have and maintain accurate records of their customers so that they can communicate with, their, with the customers. Um, and as many organizations are now moving to, to the cloud, um, it's imperative uh, for retailers to ensure that they are not keeping um, duplicate copies of their data. They're able to really prioritize the data that they want to start their migration. So being able to have um, you know, customer 360, um, being able to link all the customer data to all the related attributes, activities, and findings, and being able to create um, uh, business policies that help monitor uh, the movement, um, storage, um, the placement of the data is, is, is really critical. So when it comes to some of these concepts, um, correlation, um, able to look across your data landscape. Again, not just a, a data that's saved in one particular database, but what if it's a, a file? What's it's, what if it's saved in your, your CRM tool, your marketing tool, uh, et cetera? You wanna make sure that you're able to look across these different siloed applications and understand how it all connects together. And this, uh, illustration that you see here today is um, based on leveraging graph technology um, and building out almost like a 
I like to call it a spider web of information that ties it back ultimately to a, a data element or it can tie back to a person or an entity, an account, for example. It helps you find, helps organization find hidden relationships um, between the data that you never, you know, you're never going to quite um, see. You know, you're not going to know or be able to infer that um, there are dependencies or um, other relationships that you know just kind of pop up when this type of uh, correlation is built. And this is what I meant by earlier when I said and there's a lot of data, but having that insight and then being able to take action on it is really the um, you know challenge that data organizations face today. Um, and by way of correlation, being able to see those hidden relationships allow data teams to, to then take action. Um, another challenge that uh, many data teams today face is being um, asked to map um, their logical data or business terms, logical concepts, um, to their physical data level, data layer. So, um, you know, you can have a concept around um, uh, customer email address, but uh, the actual data for customer email address could be saved in um, emails or, or other documents, or can be saved in your, your storage systems. But you know, being able to um, leverage technology, AI machine learning technology to map that all together has been um, quite critical. Now this third use case, and predominantly we've been seeing across the healthcare sector. Um, we've also seen it in amongst uh, many pharmaceutical companies and healthcare companies is the fact that, um, you know, there are now new regulations um, popping up around healthcare that uh, ask for, you know, transparency around patient data and really being able to um, uh, publicly provide all that data and um, you know, a lot of healthcare providers um, have to adhere to um, HIPAA compliance, which is uh, you know very similar to um, you know similar to uh, privacy regulations, where they have to keep um, and maintain consent for uh, patient data that could actually vary across not only. Um, just within states in, in, in the United States, you can, you can have varying levels of co consent that you need to maintain. So all these uh, you know, policies around information security, how long retention, how long you have to keep all this information, you know, just adds to the layer of complexities of you know, maintaining this data um, and the concept of you know, remediating or, or fixing the data is, is a concept that uh, we hear about uh, quite often. Um, also, when it comes to uh, CMS interoperability, this is where the exchange of information um, is going to be really important, especially when it comes to shared data exchanges or marketplaces and being able to um, you know, build upon the, the data that's gonna be available and making sure that it can be consumed for a better analysis. So when it comes to healthcare, a lot of the um, ways that data is being collected is still in unstructured format. So being able to, again, leverage concept of um, cluster analysis that focuses on fuzzy matching when it comes to the data attributes that are found inside the contents of these documents or PDF files, um, you know, being able to understand um, the size of information. Uh, for example, in this case, um, the biggest circle is around medical registration, which depicts that there's a lot of tax files, files, unstructured data that um, relates to the topic of medical re um, registration. Similarly, around um, prescriptions and doctor notes and patient records, and this shows um, a data team and technology team um, how much information is out there that's needed to be consolidated or minimized as part of reduction, reducing your technology footprint. 
and also by in terms of um, minimizing your risk as well because you are adhering to your data policies. So hopefully some of these use cases and approaches around managing data, um, really emphasizing if um, you're going to if you're going to reinvent or improve and scale up your enterprise information management program, you want to start with metadata and data because that helps to automate and really scale up and build out um, a lot of your processes. Firstly, by you know automating your discovery process and the ability to you know, connect all your data together, that allows you to eliminate your data silos. You're giving yourself a um, 360 degree view of visibility across your entire landscape. At the same time, adhering to privacy regulations or industry specific regulations that really require you to have a full handle of, of your data. And then, once that's done, once that foundation is starting to be built out, um, being able to activate um, your entire information life cycle when it comes to um, managing the data and making sure that um, deleting the data um, properly as well. Other use cases when it comes to um, looking at metadata and data from a grounds up perspective is, is really helping with um, cloud or data lake migration projects, consolidating data. You know, there are so many efforts that go on today um, with prioritization for cloud projects, but um, with, without um, leveraging any of these automated techniques makes it really difficult because um, otherwise you'll just be looking at um, domains one by one, looking at files, uh, with a singular view in mind, and that just uh, prolongs the whole process. Um, lastly, security data access is a huge priority for many organizations who are thinking not just when it comes to data access, but having the right controls in place and really reducing um, any potential uh, data breaches. And fundamentally, this is first and foremost, you know, knowing your data, but now knowing your data from a metadata and also a data perspective allows you to, to really take on a lot of, of automation. And ultimately, business outcomes that um, organizations are really looking today um, comes to reducing your risk, um, supporting your data lifecycle management, allowing your business teams to build new products, um, find competitive edge, and really innovating on top of data that's already um, being collected and consumed today. Building customer trust um, is, is really critical because you wanna be able to, um, even as a data consumer internally, um, you wanna be able to trust the data that you have access to and that you're looking at. Um, otherwise, uh, there, if there are discrepancies or differences in, in the data or different teams are using the, the same data differently or collecting it differently, um, you know, you're just gonna be at a standstill and, and not know what to do. Um, ultimately, as an organization, you wanna achieve um, compliance, you want to pass all your audit tests, and you wanna make sure that um, you're doing this consistently and in a shared process. So Big ID really sits at the center, our technology of discovery, classification, really bringing this intelligence and actionable insights um, really supports you know, privacy use cases. A lot of our um, stakeholders are on privacy, um, security, our uh, security teams, um, you know, look for us in terms of helping with um, a lot of their use cases, and then um, governance, really building out those foundational capabilities of um, insights around data quality and data lineage. So I hoped what I shared today can give everyone insights into ways that a data program can be accelerated by focusing on metadata and data, and a lot of new technologies focusing on AI and machine learning, especially those at Big ID, 
can really help accelerate and bring these business values and reducing risk and, and adhering to compliance. Bring that together faster and make that a winning combination for your organization. So uh, with that said, I thank you for your time and I hope you enjoy the remaining sessions at Enterprise Data World. Thank you. All right, thank you, Peggy, for this great presentation and thanks to our attendees for tuning in. Please complete the EDW conference surveys uh, located at the bottom of this page. The next sessions will start in a few minutes. If you guys have some questions, make sure uh, to add them on the right side of the Q&A and we'll get back to you on those. Thank you.